we're talking about uh, momentum and position and about the relationship between position and uh, position and momentum. And what's going to make this discussion useful or important is that when we move on to later parts of the course and we start talking about uh, the velocity of electrons moving in a material, so we can talk about the conductivity. Well, to do that, we have to understand uh, what the definition of velocity is in quantum mechanics. So we're going to work a little bit ahead right now, but uh, I think it'll be it'll be useful. about a free particle. So right and we solved the free particle earlier and when we did that uh, we had our Hamiltonian, which is our Hamiltonian the function of position and if we allow our wave function which is a function of position, and this is a free particle in one dimensional space. You can do this in two and three dimensions as, as well. Uh, you just take up a lot more uh, whiteboard marker. So we'll, uh, we'll just confine ourselves to 1D. One, one uh, we can say that our, our wave function is separable, and you can prove to yourself that substituting these in, you'll definitely get. Uh, a Schrodinger equation that separates into a time-dependent and a uh, position-dependent part. And what's more, you'll find that your, oh, sorry, that x should be a t. Uh, you'll find that your time-dependent part looks like this. x of negative i over R T, which is pretty uh, familiar looking. Well, this uh, coefficient here, we, we know that this has to be dimensionless, and this is units of time, which means this is units of one over time, it's frequency. So frequency is equal to E over H bar, or E is equal to H bar omega, which you may remember from your uh, chemistry class. Right? In, in uh, black body radiation, in black body radiation, we were using E is equal to N H nu, which is N to pi h bar, sorry, sorry, and h, my hand automatically draws the bar on the h. So in black body radiation, we did e equals n h nu, which means that we had n 2 pi h bar, h bar is the reduced Planck constant, uh, omega over 2 pi, the relationship between frequency and angular frequency, which means P is equal to uh, h bar omega, and h bar omega. So that's from, from black body radiation. Uh, so that's where E is equal to h bar omega comes from. Uh, going back to our time dependent part, sorry, our position dependent part, we know that the position dependent part uh, is again just a plane wave, and we saw that last time. So we know that x x is equal to a e to the i k x plus b e to the minus i k 
x. And last time we also solved that e is equal to h bar squared k squared over 2m. And in this case, because it's a free particle, k is a continuous variable. Right? We haven't quantized this at all. So that's uh, the solution for a particle in free space. Now, uh, we know also that momentum and energy, those two operators commute. And we solved momentum in 1D, and in the case of momentum, we had a solution to look like this. V dx is equal to A e to the i kx. And k is still a continuum value. Um, in this case, it can be plus infinity or minus infinity. And remember, k in the case of a plane wave is the wave vector and is telling you the direction and the wavelength uh, of the wave. So it can be going that way or it can be going that way. And we also found uh, P is equal to H bar K. Which means that you know if we measure a particular value, so momentum, if we measure the momentum, we're going to find a particular value of k, let's make it uh, p is equal to uh, h bar, we'll call it, uh, you know, k, uh, uh, you know, we'll call it k prime. So it's a particular value, it's not all values. Uh, if we measure this, we get a particular value, the wave function collapses now to a e to the i k prime x. And because of the commutator relation, we can measure energy measure the energy, what we're going to find is E is equal to h bar squared k prime squared over 2m. And we'll find a wave function that is a e to the i k prime x plus you know, 0 e to the minus a k prime x. 0 might make you feel better. The important thing is that it's a plane wave. And if you want to think about it, uh, you can think of energy as being, you know, the kinetic energy and the momentum telling you it's going to the left or going to the right, whether it's uh, a plus or a minus in front of it. But nonetheless, they have the same wave function and the same uh, value for k. So you can see here that this means that having the same, having a uh, commutation relation equal to zero means that you can simultaneously know the energy and the momentum. So let's talk about velocity now. So let's say we've got some particular value, let's well, call it k prime still, why not? And this three particle with a particular value of you know momentum k prime. Uh, Right? So this is some 
a terrible drawing, but there are some sign, sign of X. Well, if we wait, you know, some small amount of time, and we look at it again, the wave is propagated. Right? Plane waves propagate, and this plane wave will propagate. We've got a brand new orange marker for that, and that brand new orange marker will tell us that the plane wave propagated. certain amount. It propagated by some delta x, which means that this is now sine x plus X plus, you know, X epsilon, you know, epsilon greater than zero. It's propagated by a certain amount. So if this wave is propagating, we can talk about the velocity that it propagates. And from wave mechanics, we have that the velocity is equal to omega over k. And if we multiply the top and the bottom by h bar, so we multiply the whole thing by uh, <clears throat> 1, then we can say that this is equal to the energy divided by h bar k. But we know the energy from our eigenfunction solution is h bar squared k squared over 2m over h bar k, which means that the velocity is h bar k over 2m is equal to the momentum over 2m is equal to m v over 2m is equal to one half v. What? Right. That's exactly it. This v is the classical, the classical velocity. This v and this v are not the same. This v is the velocity that a particular plane wave propagates. And we're going to refer to that as the phase velocity. So the phase velocity is equal to 1 half the classical velocity. So the classical velocity is coming about because of our uh, uh, momentum relation there. So this is the velocity with which a plane wave is going to travel. But when we're talking about particles, the particles that we're interested in and which have a classical velocity uh, don't travel as They don't travel like this. They travel as a wave packet. So what you're going to find, you're going to find something that does this. You've got a wave packet, and inside the wave packet, you have waves. And in fact, you've got lots of waves of different, different values for uh, uh, K. And the packet travels what we call VG, or the group velocity. And then inside the wave packet, 
you're going to have these individual plane waves going back and forth with dp. So the group velocity, that's equivalent to classical. And uh, kind of the last point here I want to write, because I want to finish my page, dp is equal to omega over k. So this phase velocity, we're defining here in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, angular frequency and the wave vector of the plane wave. This uh, velocity goes uh, one over the uh, angular frequency. Sorry, the angular frequency divided by the wave vector, and that turns out to be one half the classical velocity. So we put a little p down here. It turns out this is the phase velocity. This is the velocity. <coughs> of uh, individual plane waves. Now, particles, photons, uh, electrons, etc., are not uh, plane waves. They are superpositions of waves. Oh, they're locked out. You're <laughs> 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 all stuck in here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to block the sound. <laughs> Thought you'd tunnel through the wall or something. Uh, <laughs> just not enough energy. Uh, in principle, enough energy, you could tunnel through the door. Just, just splatter before you made it through, usually. Um, right. Uh, particles are not single plane waves, which means uh, that what they actually are is they're superposition of plane waves, and those superposition of plane waves will tend to group themselves together in this type of wave packet. And what you have is you have a wave packet which has a group velocity, the velocity of that entire group of waves that are in superposition, and they are within some envelope function, and that envelope function travels with what we call a group velocity, which is equivalent to the classical velocity. And what I'd like to do now is to show you where the classical velocity comes from, or the group velocity, uh, because we'll be using this when we get to uh, band theory of solids. Because when we talk about an electron moving through a solid, uh, we're talking about the group velocity. So, I'll wipe this out. So remember, we can write our wave function as a superposition. So, I'll write our wave function as a capital Psi. Be some a1 and I'm using psi1 plus a2 psi2 plus da, da, da. So we've got our wave function written as a linear <coughs> superposition of states. Each one of these states is a uh, particular solution to our Schrodinger equation. Each one of these coefficients gives us the you know, projection of the wave function into these particular basis states, right? We're thinking of our, our eigenfunctions as a basis in Hilbert space. Um, and that means that this then is, is equal to sum j equals 1 to infinity aj psi j. It's a linear, uh, it's an infinite dimensional space. Most of the time, you're not dealing, in practical matters, you're not dealing with infinite dimensions because, for example, if these are eigenfunctions of energy, energy is finite, so you don't have to go to an infinite energy, but instead you're, you're bracketed. But nonetheless, this is what we wind up with. Now, if we want to think not in terms of a discretized space, for example, uh, Instead of uh, thinking about uh, energy, which is discretized, uh, we can talk about uh, a continuous distribution. For example, if instead of, uh, instead of uh, energies, we think about expressing this in terms of momentum. And we saw that for a particle in free space, it can take any value of momentum. 
So we could replace the sum with an integral and integrate over all of the allowed uh, momentums. And if we do that, we get our wave function, which is a function of position and time. Again, I'm just writing one dimension, but you can take this out to uh, three. And you get something that looks like this. Two pi h bar integral Is something like this. So in, in this expression, uh, we've used, love it, I guess, we've used that Px, the momentum in x direction, is equal to h bar k, and we used that the energy is equal to h bar omega. Right, so it's the same functional form that we had before, but we just uh, re-expressed it in terms of the momentum. So this exponential is our basis function. Right? This was our uh, <clears throat> psi, call it subscript p of x. So p is the particular uh, uh, momentum. And this, now, is our coefficient. And we're getting this as a direct analogy to the sum. Except now it's an integral, and instead of summing over all these coefficients, we're integrating over all of these coefficients, and the coefficients are functions of p. So what, what is the coefficient, right? Well, we know up here in our sum that the coefficients are the probabilities of finding the particle in one of these particular states. And the same is true here. Now, the probability of measuring momentum, a particular momentum value, Px, <clears throat> that is equal to Squared. Right? In much the same way over here, Pj is equal to Aj squared. Right? So essentially, we can have the probability of measuring P in a particular momentum, Px, versus Px, and it's going to be some distribution, right? So that distribution is going to have some whatever, p0 and some delta p. And that distribution is going to be related to the magnitude or the, uh, the value of the uh, 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 coefficients in front of our basis states. <clears throat> okay, so let's take and simplify this expression, and we're going to simplify it. I'll do this with a different color so that I don't have to rewrite everything. Let's take and simplify it to Beta. Right? Where beta is not a function of Px. So beta is equal to Px x minus E Px t. 
And if we look at this solution, these coefficients, these are well behaved, right? They're just some statistical distribution. They, you know, they go out to zero on this end, they go out to zero on that end, they integrate to one. Uh, we know they're well behaved. But in exponential, it oscillates all over the place. And our wave function has to be well behaved. So the only way that our wave function can be well behaved is if that is a constant. And the definition of that being a constant is that the derivative of beta dx with respect to dx that has to be equal to zero. Which means that the derivative with respect to px of px x minus e px t is equal to zero, which means that x minus t, the derivative of e with respect to px is equal to zero, which means that x is equal to t de by d dx. And thinking about this in terms of units, you've got length here, and here we've got time, which means that this has to be uh, length per time, or t e g. That is where our velocity comes from. So we've got a group velocity that's defined as x, and we can go back to our, which I erased it, our definitions of the energy and the momentum, and get h bar d omega k h bar d k, h bars cancel out. So the group velocity is equal to the derivative with respect to the wave vector of the frequency of the function of the wave vector. And that's the definition of, of uh, group velocity. Now, this frequency as a function of wave vector and the energy E, which can also be written as a, as a function of k because we can put in uh, h bar k in for uh, uh, momentum here. Uh, these are called dispersion relations. And what's important about that, something you're going to see later in this class is that we have these band structures that describe the electronic states of materials. And those band structures give us things such as energy as a function of K. You may have seen these in literature or textbooks or whatever. Maybe something like that. And this tells us then that at any particular point, that the slope of these dispersion relations, which we'll see in the, the middle third of the class, give us the velocity. And that means that when you come to these flat places, like here, you have zero velocity, which is in particular why you wind up with these flat places when you get to uh, the edge of uh, the Brillouin zone edge and the center of, of the Brillouin zone. 
this okay? Oh. Are you going to get further into the band gap stuff for the week <clears throat> later? Yes. Okay. Like, I mean, the middle third, so the middle third of the class is going to be focused on uh, band theory of solids, and we're going to get into this, where these come from, why they open up, and uh, why people call, talk about things such as reflections from the Brillouin zone edge. Well, it's not really a reflection, things don't bounce off it, but what happens is you wind up with a, a band zone, a band edge, or sorry, a Brillouin zone edge, and you wind up with a place of zero, so you can think of the, the particle reaches the zone edge, and then it reverses velocity. So it kind of is a reflection, but it comes about because of the dispersion relation and the change in velocity. So other, other things about this that are important. Other things about this that are important is that we had this equation that I just erased. Uh, and I might as well finish it off. I let it live along in pain. Uh, we had this expression for the uh, wave function in terms of uh, momentum. And we can take that and we say, well, what happens at time t equals zero? So at t equals zero, we can take that wave function and rewrite it x to one over square root two pi h bar integral so I put the t equals zero in there and that got rid of the energy term and, and this is what we have but if you look at this when you have x, 1 over, and then two variables, that is essentially a Fourier transform. So this, the Fourier transform of psi x is equal to phi p, and the inverse Fourier transform of phi p is equal to psi x. And this also tells us that phi x is equal to 1 over uh, the square root 2 pi h bar integral from minus infinity to plus infinity dx psi x x minus i p x, x one over k. <clears throat> so these are related through the Fourier transform. We refer to this as the momentum space representation of the wave function. And for those of you familiar with uh, Fourier transforms, you're all engineers, or a lot of you are engineers, recognize that there's things that you can do in Fourier space that you can't do in real space. So it's really handy to be able to go switch it back and forth between those. Uh, so let's, let's take our knowledge of this and, and look at something which is uh, going to give us a little bit of physical insight. Let's consider. Let's consider a distribution that is, uh, well, physically meaningful. Let, let's say, let's say that uh, our momentum space representation, okay, px equal to c x negative. <coughs> Zero squared over two over dx squared. That's a Gaussian, right? 
So let's say that we have P squared that looks something like this. P0 and delta Px. That makes sense, right? If you say, you know, I, I measure the electron velocity and I know, you know, this stream of electrons has an average momentum or average velocity and uh, a distribution. Well, uh, one thing we need to do is we need to uh, find what that coefficient is. So, going over here, we take the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of psi star psi set it equal to 1. Uh, and I'm going to skip the math here and just tell you that this yields c is equal to uh, delta px squared pi negative 1. One fourth. So that allows us to fill in there for delta p x squared pi to the minus one fourth. So now we've got some physical measurement of, of, uh, of pi. This means that taking the inverse Fourier transform of that, uh, you're going to wind up with transform of a Gaussian is also a Gaussian. And with this Gaussian, delta x is equal to h bar over delta p x. And it also tells us that delta x delta p x in this particular case is going to be h bar, which is consistent with the uncertainty principle. Now, If delta p goes to zero, let's say we have a really accurate way of measuring this momentum, or you know we've got some you know, crazy monoenergetic beam of, of particles, and we get some gets. So as delta p goes to zero. Then what happens is that phi px goes to p0, right? You're basically taking this Gaussian, squeezing it shut, and this expression uh, goes to p0. It's a constant. But if this goes to a constant, then that means that our Real space goes to x i x p zero h bar. 
This is a simple plane wave. It's no longer a superposition of plane waves. But a simple plane wave, it looks like this. It's flat. And if it's flat, then that means delta x goes to infinity. <clears throat> right? Because we know that the probability of measuring the particle anywhere in this space is the wave function mod squared, but it goes out to plus and minus infinity with equal probability. So this means that as we have a more accurate measurement of momentum, because these are related by a Fourier transform, we lose information about position. And I think this is kind of a, a it's kind of a cool way of showing that everything that we're talking about from our postulates, it, it works out uh, mathematically. Now, another way you can think about this, another way you can think about this is you can think about the time evolution of the wave function, right? So let, let's go back and, and rewrite our time-dependent wave function. Skip some of the math in here. Uh, but let's say we have a time dependent wave function. Let's say we've got uh, psi x t to 2 pi h bar minus 1 half integral from minus infinity to plus infinity x i dx x minus e dx t h bar dx. Okay. So using our uh, uh, Gaussian expression, energy be px squared over 2m, and that being, uh, well, I don't have to rewrite this, so it's going to be our Gaussian. Uh, if you uh, crank through a, just a bunch of math, <clears throat> math, dot, 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 you wind up with psi x t is equal to pi to the minus one fourth delta p x over h bar one plus i delta p x t over m h bar to the one half x of i p0 x over h bar minus delta p x over h bar squared x squared over 2 minus i p0 t over 2 m h bar over 1 plus I delta P X squared T over M H bar. Okay, you get that. And if we take now and we plot, we plot the probability as a function of position and as a function of time, dx is equal to psi x squared versus x, you'll do this. And as time passes, So, 
basically have a particle, you know its position. So, <clears throat> one, two, three. Uh, and we have some momentum that's heading you know, in the, you know, in this case, the plus x direction. Yeah. This area of the, the wave stays the same, right? Yes, it does. Because right. you have to say, so the uh, uh, the area under each probability curve has to still equal 1. Right. So it has to be normalized. Uh, so the, we have momentum. We know the direction is heading. The momentum is defined by our uh, Gaussian and is centered on p0 and has a delta px. The width of our x position, x is equal to delta x as a function of time, because we have time in here, and we're taking that wave function as a function of position and time, and taking the mod squared is equal to h bar over delta px 1 minus delta px to the fourth over m squared h bar squared t squared 1 half. So we know the average value of x as a function of time and is centered, but our uncertainty in the position spreads out as time passes and the rate that the time spreads out uh, it's going to be inverse to the, uh, the width of the uncertainty of the momentum. 